Alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Dear fellow victors in our Savior, Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. It was about a year and four months ago that a story came across, a, a heard a story in the news about a man in Illinois. A man in Illinois who had spent 30 years after being convicted of murder. He spent 30 years in prison. A year and four months ago, DNA evidence was found that exonerated him and he was proved not to be the killer. He was set free. After he was set free, I feel vindicated, he said. What's it mean to be vindicated? To be cleared of guilt? To be proven right? This Lenten season, we have followed the theme, God on trial. A number of words describe Jesus as he was on trial before the leaders of the Jewish people, on trial before the uh, governor Pontius Pilate. He was declared guilty. But today we see his vindication. That Jesus is declared innocent. He's declared innocent and we are justified through the events of Easter Sunday. Let's hear those events found in Mark chapter 8, 16 verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they could go and anoint Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. They were saying to each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away as they entered the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. He said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They went out and hurried away from the tomb, trembling and perplexed. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So friends in, in Christ Jesus, God on trial, definitely Jesus, when he was on trial, was a literal God on trial. But God is still put on trial today. And so as we think about how God on trial applies to us, let's look at the vindication of Jesus. Why did Jesus need to be vindicated? Why is vindication uh, a word that would apply to him? Well, if you look at what happened on Good Friday, it looked like Jesus was wrong. On trial by the Jewish leaders, condemned as guilty of blasphemy, Pontius Pilate handed down the sentence, death by crucifixion. If he were the God, he claimed he couldn't he have escaped from that cross, from the whipping, from the bleeding, from the crown of thorns, hanging between two criminals? But there was no escape. The women who had followed him watched him as he breathed his last, and like every other person who had ever been hung on a cross, he gave up his spirit. He died. They watched as Joseph of Arimathea took his lifeless body down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. As sun set that night, it must have been impossible for those women to process everything. So much had happened so quickly, and things just didn't look good. After a lengthy jury deliberation, in our days, a defendant might say, 
Those were the longest hours of my life. It seemed like time was standing still as the defendant is waiting for the jury to come back. <laughs> There's no way of knowing exactly what was going through the minds of Jesus' followers in those hours, but no doubt, it felt like hours that would not end. And it definitely would have included a bitter mix of sadness, confusion, doubt, and fear. Maybe you can relate. I expect most of us, all of us, I would think, can. Someone you love deeply has died. Uh, the funeral is over. Your family and your friends returned to their homes. And the darkness settles on the day. It's too quiet. You feel very alone. Lord, I feel so lost. Uh, so confused, I just don't understand. But it's not just the death of a loved one that can leave us feeling like the hours have no end. Thoughts of our own death lurk in the background, don't they? Whether or not we're really conscious of it, the voice gets louder and louder and louder as we age. Time is running out. Our bodies fail. They're failing more this year than last year, more this year than 10 years ago. Our minds even begin to forget our minds are fading too. But even for the young, there's anxiety about making the right choices. Friends, love, career, college. There's a million possibilities, but a limited amount of time against that backdrop of life, this brief life, our sinful choices appear like enlarged shadows looming over us, magnified in our minds. How have we let our Savior down? Jesus wasn't guilty. He was not guilty, but we sure are. And we think about that as our bodies fail, as the anxiety of making wrong decisions plagues us. We do not know exactly what the women were thinking on that Easter morning. Were they thinking that it felt like one hour was an eternity? We don't know what they thought. We make some assumptions. But we definitely know from the Gospel writer Mark what they were doing. At break of dawn, they went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, one final act of love for their teacher. But when they got there, they saw that the stone was rolled away. And surprisingly, a young man in a white robe was inside the tomb, and he said, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? What did all this mean? Even though Jesus had predicted his own death and his resurrection on several occasions, it all seemed too much to process for the women. What did all of this mean? If the women had expected Jesus to be alive, they wouldn't have gone into the tomb, gone to the tomb to anoint his body. And so they were surprised. And they left Perplexed, They went out hurried away from the tomb, trembling and perplexed. But soon, it would all sink in. Later that same day, Jesus would appear to them, and, and to Peter, and to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then to the eleven behind locked doors. And a week later, he would appear to the eleven with Thomas, and then to five hundred believers at once. Early reports, they were corroborated over and over again. It was true, Jesus was alive. It was a vindication of every single thing that he had said. Paul spells it all out in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. We heard that in our second lesson a, a little bit ago. And, and it's needed, we need it to complement what is found in Mark chapter 16. A little bit further explanation so that we're not left just with 
the perplexity and the wondering and the fear. We have vindication. We have vindication because there's a big if. If Jesus had not risen, we would have no reason to believe that he was anything more than a fraud. Uh, another criminal dead from crucifixion. If Jesus did not come back from the dead, we would surely have no reason to believe that his declaration of forgiveness of sins carried any weight at all. If, if the tomb is not empty, then death is still our lasting fate. But notice something. Those ifs are all contrary to fact. In grammar, a contrary to fact thing says, it's not true. It's considering the possibility of what if, but that what if is standing in the corner, and he may be speaking, but it's not a reality. What if Jesus had not been raised? Don't have to worry about that. You don't. Because Jesus has truly been raised from the dead. If our hope in Christ applies only to this life, we are the most pitiful of all people, but that is a contrary to fact if. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, declared in a vindication way that leaves no room for doubt. Easter is just that. Easter is vindication. It wasn't on Friday. Jesus did not come down from the cross to prove that he was the Son of God. He, he loved you too much to do that. He wouldn't because his work was not yet complete. Rather than coming down from the cross to prove he was the Son of God, he did something better. He rose from the dead to prove it. On Easter, Jesus proved that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Savior, everything that he claimed to be. Easter is that vindication. Jesus did look guilty on the cross. It wasn't the charge above his head, though. It wasn't the fact that he was between two criminals. It was the fact of his own declaration, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a cry from the depths of his own punishment. That Jesus did have guilt on the cross, but it was not ours. The Lord laid on him the iniquity. It was not his own, it was ours. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God punished all our sins on Jesus. By raising his son from the dead, the Father declared what Jesus himself also declared, and his final words, his words, some of his final words from the cross, it is finished. No more payment for sin was needed. This is vindication. Your sins are paid for. Mine are too, because Jesus paid it all. There's a noticeable personification, per personalization in what the angel says to the women. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, you wonder why she picks out, why the angel, why the, the women are told to go to talk, especially to Peter? Well, all the disciples needed to know that truth that Jesus lives, but, but Peter had done more. He hadn't just abandoned his Lord, running away like all the disciples did. He denied him, and not only once, not only twice, but three times. I don't know the man. Peter had hours that seemed like days, weeks, months, or years. Seemed like they were never going to end. But Jesus personally wants him to know, Peter, this vindication is for you. I am alive. Your sins are forgiven. All of the depths of, of despair that you are in, it's time for that to end. You have denied me, but I will never forsake you. Jesus loves 
you. He forgives you too. You could think of the women being told by the angel, go and tell the disciples and insert your name. Because Jesus wants you to know about this vindication. I paid for all your sin. You have worried, you have doubted, you have done all kinds of things against me. You have lived life as if you weren't my child. But I paid for it all. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you or abandon you. Jesus has come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Easter is vindication also for you, for all of you. You have placed your hope in Jesus, and you are proven right. Proven right by Jesus' resurrection. If Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, we do have hope beyond this life. Because the Apostle Paul describes Jesus as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits are that wonderful symbol, the promise of the second fruits. So Jesus' resurrection is a promise of the resurrection of all of his people. But each in his own order, Christ as the first fruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. That day will be our ultimate vindication. But even now, Easter is vindication for us as we live in a people judged by this world. God is in tr on trial by this world, and so are Jesus' followers. There's been a lot of talk about the decline of the Christian church in the United States. Fewer and fewer people in this country follow Jesus. Attendance in the United States is going down. Attendance in churches. Is the church dying, we may ask? Is that even possible? No, it is not. The church is Jesus' own body, and he calls it that, and he declares that he is with his church, and Christ Jesus lives. How can the church be dying when it is the body of Christ Jesus? Congregations may die, and Christians may fall away, but as long as Jesus lives, so will his church. Let us be sure that we hold to the truth that he has declared, that he has forgiven us by his death, that he has brought us into his family, and we are members of his kingdom. Jesus is the proof of that in his resurrection. His resurrection from the dead is vindication, and we can testify to that simple truth in humble, almost imperceptible ways until we finally sing the victory song together with Jesus in heaven. Vindication. Jesus comes to you and me in that personal way in the Word of God. And perhaps you've been here in a church service where a siren has given past a fire truck or a, a police car or an ambulance. And maybe you've been there when a loved one or even you has been at the destination that the ambulance was going. Do you realize that even then, even then, you have the vindication of the truth? You know that if the ambulance is coming from you, for you, you still can trust in the love of your loving Lord God. Jesus Christ is your Savior, and even if the paramedics and the hospital workers and the ambulance driver can't do anything to lengthen your life or rescue you, Jesus' resurrection is vindication that this life is not the end, that you will live together with God forever. Sin is forgiven. Death is defeated. Jesus is Lord, and Christ and his people have been put on trial. Easter proclaims the victorious verdict, vindication, proved not guilty, proved true, alleluia, and amen. May the God of peace, 
who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.